but we only need a few minutes because we behind. And I just want to tell you something that even though we're doing an hour, we're still 20 minutes behind. But the good thing is we nearly finished chapter six. All right, Kevin, teach us. Go for it. You'll tell us, tell me when to stop if I go over. Okay, Damon. Well, uh, sure. Uh, okay, this is for a first slammer for all the volume of Clan Israel. All right. Okay. Continuing with this is the last last bit that I'm going to do something else also uh, about interruptions. Um, okay, one who is reciting Pesukah de Zimra shouldn't be called up to the Torah. Um, he may only called up if he is a Kohen or a Levi and there aren't any Kohanim or Levim present. Additionally, since he is in the middle of Pesukah de Zimra, he may not interrupt his prayer to ask the Gabbai and tell him, Please, I can't do it. The Gabai will see and will um, improvise or make an alternative plan. However, in a situation in which the government mistakenly calls Israel, who is still in the middle of reciting Pesukah de Zimra, he must go up out of respect for the Torah and the congregation. Okay, let's, okay, so let's uh, close that issue about interruptions and just to start a new topic here which will obviously continue it says when is a new bracha rishona required and i think we've actually touched on this in side uh, side discussions okay so uh it says uh, as long as one didn't have an interruption i.e train of thought uh, it'll be clarified as follows one doesn't need a new bracha rishona um, okay, this is actually talking about food. Okay, it's not talking about davening. Should we actually do the continue next time? Yeah, please. let's do that as a separate. Okay, so the main thing is, and I think we know it as well. Uh, if we get, if if, if a guy sees you in the middle of dav, he'll come up to you. If he see, if he calls you while you're in the ministry of Israel, you're not going to look up. You're supposed to be con concentrating on the, on on the on the text on the, on the actual one of Israel. If, if he calls you and you, you're not, you don't hear him, which if we, sometimes we don't, he'll come and he'll see where we are, then he'll hopefully call up someone else. They'll see yeah. that you're davening. I'm sure it's happened to all of us before. Yeah, sure. I don't know if, if, we, if we're late that, or we're, if we're running late or behind. Yeah, that's true. Okay, let's get, uh, okay. Let's get uh, started. All right, I'm going to share my screen in terms of the Mishnah. <clears throat> so hit. Uh, I wanted Arthur to read for us um, because are you on your phone or your computer, mate? Yeah, I was going to read something. Just hold on a second. I have to zoom in here on the phone side. I hope I can see it. Blah, Elizabeth. Uh, this is kind of okay. So, whoa, well, okay. I'm going to put the phone far away. Okay. Uh, Okay, it says, Mishnah, if one sets fire to the stack of grain, the utensils were hidden in it and they were burned together in, with the stack, Rav Yehuda says he pays for what was inside it, including the utensils. But the sages say he pays only for the, for the stack of wheat or the, or the barley. The Mishnah discusses another case in which a stack of grain is burned with other uh, entities. If there was a kid, therefore a young goat, bound to the stack, and the slave was near the, the stack, and even the slave, although he was not bound to the stack, was burned with it, okay, the one who lit the fire is liable to pay for the kid and the stack. If the slave were bound to the stack and the kid was near it, and even the kid, although it was not bound to the stack, was burnt with it, uh, the one who lit the fire is exempt from monetary liability. The mission returns to the dispute between the sages and Rabbi Huda concerning one, one whose fire burned hidden articles. But the sages agree with Rav Yehuda in the case where uh, the one who sets fire to a large tower that he pays for everything inside it because it's, it's, it, it is the way of people to put things in houses. 
Yeah. All right. Did you uh, hear that? Yeah, yeah, I did get that. Well, well read, mate. It's well read. Okay. Okay, I'm just going to... Yeah, but it was nice to hear you reading for a change. It was lovely. All right. Yeah, it was kind of like far away from me, but a bit small, but I did it. Yeah, I know you did a good job. Uh, guys, I'm just going to focus on the middle part because we've already said if one set fire to a stack of grain and utensils were hidden in it and they were burned together with the stack, Rav Yehuda says he pays for what is inside, including the utensils, but the sages say only pays for a stack of wheat and barley. That we've done, we know. Um, we're obviously talking in a case where he doesn't go to his neighbor's premises and uh, set side fire to the uh, stack of grain there. It's obviously the default position that uh, it's talking about in Exodus chapter 22, verse 5, is that he set the fire in his own premises and got out of control. But he's obviously also responsible. Now, there's something I want to discuss with you that, that we have done before. A lot of these concepts have been reiterated is that if there was a kid, uh, I, the first time I was horrified, I read this, I, I thought it meant a child. So I'd rather refer to the word of a young goat in case mm -hmm. anybody is uh, listening to this, they'd be horrified. So if there was a young goat bound to the stack of grain and the slave was near the stack, and even though the slave, although he was not bound to the stack, was burnt with it, the one who lit the fire is liable to pay for the goat and the stack. Now, why in that case do you think he's not liable to um, pay for the slave? Yeah, this is a bit weird. I found that a bit odd. That, I can't uh, use Gavin, is your mark near you. I'm oh, sorry, Gavin, I didn't hear Gavin. Okay, Gavin, so you go ahead. I didn't hear, I also didn't hear you were trying to speak. Can you hear me now? No. You get closer to the microphone, I think, Gavin. Maybe your mic. Yeah, yeah, it's not, it's not loud at all. Yeah. Now? But yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Slightly better. Yeah. Can you hear yeah. us, Gav? Uh, yeah, I can hear you guys perfectly. And you can hear me perfectly now as well. Yes. All right, perfect. All right, let me go back. Uh, Oh, okay, so my answer was as such, the, the slave, the reason why you're not obligated for the slave, because the slave wasn't bound, he could have run away. That's it. Exactly, exactly. Uh, so there, um, uh, well, that's exactly the perfect answer. And then in a case where um, the slave was bound to the stack and the goat was near it, and even though the goat, although it wasn't bound to the stack, was burnt with it, the one who lit the fire is exempt from monetary liability. Why, guys? We've done this before. I'm testing you. No reason you can, you can just run away the road. Is the no slave... Now, that's um, the question I'm asking. Let me just clear my question up. Gavin was right to uh, say that based on the fact that my question wasn't clear. In other words, the slave is bound to the stack. And the goat was near it. And even the goat, although it wasn't down to the stack, was burnt with it. The one who lit the fire is exempt from monetary liability. So my first question, there's three questions, is why is he not bound, Arthur? I want to ask Arthur specifically. Why is he not bound for financial liability to the owner of the slave? Isn't that to do with the fact that... Um... It's, 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 it's a, it's a, a he, he, because it's for murder, basically. That's what I think. Okay. And you can't do, you can't, you, uh, there's no financial thing for Gasly, murder. What's this background noise from? It's music. So that's, uh, who's, uh, somebody started a program here, guys. The cat jumped on the mouse. The TV was on. Okay. No. Couldn't work out what's going on there. Okay. Okay. I'll yep. You started it again. Okay, because the guy was bound, it's actually murder. And therefore, okay. why is he not also? And therefore, the, why is he not also? Because you can't financial you, liability. Because you can either have financial liability or um, what do you call that? There are two things you could have. He could either um, be death penalty. He has to give his life. Liability is that? Yeah, that's it. that's what I was looking for. Yes, yes. And you can't have both. Is that right? No, you can't. You, you can't have a double penalty. 
Why? Good. He's going to give you a lot for you. Because, the, because basically, it's like uh, you benefiting extra from his death. Okay, you can either give his no, life no, 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 no. You one right or financial. You were great, you were great until that. Okay, point. until you were great until okay. that. Point. Do you want to guys have another stab at it? Art is one hundred percent correct. What is the reason though that you call? Can I add him? another point? Maybe I'm wrong here, Damon. But yeah. the slave is considered like land, like part of the ground. Um, right. Does that have anything to do with it? No, a well, slave is. Kevin is correct in the fact that in certain cases of a lien on property, the slave is regarded as fixed property. That is right, but that's a different issue. What okay. Arthur's saying is that you can't have you can't compensate the owner of the slave because the person is actually killing a human being. A slave may be owned, but you're killing mm. a human being, and therefore the person is subject to the death penalty. And therefore, you don't make a monetary compensation. Uh, okay, that's why very I'm good. Asking is, yeah, and, and, and secondly, how did he get bound? First of all, you have to be bound. Why was he bound? For the time, because the guy tied him up. That's for murder. If you know, if he was loose, it's fine. Well, even if somebody no else tied him up, just say this. Just say, for example, this uh, slave was an aggressive guy, and the master of the slave tied him up. It still doesn't warrant somebody else. Setting a lot, uh, an area around the human being where the human being has got no means of escape. So even if the yep. person didn't exactly title, but I'm asking why is the reason that there's not a simultaneous payment as well as the death penalty? Because how does it compensate the owner of the property that was damaged to a slave? How does it compensate him? Since it doesn't, what's the reason that you can't do both? Okay. It's called Kiva. Uh, what's it? Kiva. Uh, okay. Uh, David, help me. Kim okay, Lay, did you rub me? Kim Lay, there we go. That's that's it. Yeah. It was on the tip of my tongue. That one. But due to that, what happens is you have to look at uh, uh, at at uh, either you have to take the greater out of the two out of the two punishments. Excellent. So, Perfect. Right, so I think it answers it. Perfect. So, Arthur, what happens is that if there are two death penalties, uh, stoning and uh, um, and uh, beheading, for example, uh, there's a whole discussion in Sanhedrin, is burning worse than stoning, etc. But if somebody is liable to two death penalties, you can only kill them once. So, therefore, the most stringent death penalty that would apply in the two murder cases would apply so that that provides spiritual coverage for a kapora, uh, which means an atonement for both sins, providing he's sorry. Obviously, he gets the full benefit. If he's not sorry, he just dies either way. But he must also take that opportunity of remorse at the same time, and it covers both, the more stringent. Now, if you have a case where there is... Um, uh, a capital punishment. Uh, let's just take rather a separate case of lashes and monetary payment. Lashes is worse, and therefore that compensates instead of monetary payment in terms of the atonement. Now the person is out of pocket, uh, and and you do give the greater penalty, um, as far as far as that's concerned. There's a slightly different reason that's given in Sanhedrin, and that reason is that if a person, um, well, let's just, let's just, uh, let, let's just uh, 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 keep it uh, simple, is that it has to be an act, the ER criteria, the act has to be caused at the same time. So for example, if somebody uh, uh, breaking uh, Shabbat with warning, and with the right um, uh, uh, witnesses, and they warn that this death penalty of breaking Shabbos will be such and such. There's a case where they have to get Hasra, they have to get warning, there has to be ADIM, there has to be witnesses. And there is even an opinion that you have to state what death penalty it is. And if a person's still on a suicidal bent after all of that, and they get the death penalty, then say what they do is they break Shabbos by burning somebody's Picasso. They hate their neighbor that much. And they uh, then at that particular time, they get the death penalty, so they're off the hook for burning the Picasso. 
because it's act it's it's caused by a simultaneous uh, act. Now, what did, what's this whole story about learning about uh, the gut uh, in this case? What 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 did that add to the picture? Aren't goats used for sacrifices and uh, could be? <laughs> um, okay, but. Um, they yeah, provide I mean, milk, they provide exactly. uh, milk and uh, Okay, so I'm saying what uh, revenue. What, correct. So you so the question is um even a Canaanite slave, by the way, is a is a capital offense. If a Jew kills another human being like a Canaanite slave, not an idolater, but I think a Canaanite slave has got certain privileges, like he has to uh, he's obligated to uh, certain mitzvot, the same as women. Um, not time-bound mitzvot, but because uh, his time is not his own, but I think positive mitzvot when he becomes a slave. Does that make sense? So that is in Shmuel chapter 21, verse 20, about killing a Canaanite slave is even a capital offense. But uh, as regards liability for the goat, there's a special reason it's brought here. Let me just tell you what it is is that it's a discussion whether or not it was bound to the stack. So in a case where the goat was bound to a stack, uh, there is a, um, in other words, if the, if the goat was standing near the stack, the arsonist is liable for the death because we said that an animal uh, uh, is not like a person that doesn't always have the sense to run away, okay? But the reason that the Mishnah speaks of the goat being bound to the stack is for the sake of stylistic symmetry. But not everybody agrees with that because uh, Rashi says that um, if it wasn't for the uh, goat being bound to the stack, it would have the instinct to leave. Therefore, you're not liable. But the majority of the opinions hold that the animal doesn't have the sense to leave. And therefore, if it's not bound to the stack, you're liable. But this is the issue. We learned an extension, uh, an extension principle by this, by Kim Labadi Rabba Minay, which means you would say, okay, so you created the damage at the same article that rendered you with the death penalty. So say you burnt the Picasso and that was done at the same time where you off the financial hook. Okay? That's one thing. And here you're killing the slave and you're not responsible to the owner of the slave for payment because one uh, is put to death for the capital offense of killing a Canaanite slave. But in this particular case, we would think maybe you still own the, owe the owner. Uh, it could be a separate owner. Let's just say, let's just make it more interesting. Let's say that the owner of the goat was a separate owner to the owner of the slave. Okay? He could turn around and say, well, I understand he doesn't make the financial payment for the slave because that same act caused him to get the death penalty. But why should I have to suffer? Because he destroyed my goat. So therefore, he should still pay me. Now, what do you think as far as that's concerned, Gus? It's not going to work because he's going to get killed. So he's not going to... Uh, he's going to he won't, obviously, he won't pay the lawyer. He's just saying in practice. No, 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 no. Forget about the practice because the A can take it from the ears if it's deemed to lachically liable. Or B, before okay. they kill him, he would have to pay and they could send the sheriff of the court to attach his asset. There's no, there's, there's no, there's no issue as far as that's concerned. I'm saying, what do you say, guys? Do you think the guy's got a legitimate case where the. No, I, I, I think still not. Eh? I, think, I think if you've got, uh, uh, if you've got, a whole series of cases against you. The biggest one being the death penalty uh, overrides everything else. That could be my okay. And what does uh, uh, Arthur think and Kevin think? Kevin, what do you think? Um, I've lost track, sorry. You're talking about if, if there's two, two, two claimants. Yeah, different claim of the, of the no, goat and of the slave. What I'm saying who is... Should be, very, who should be paid first? Is no, that what question is? Not, not at all. We know Kim Labadi Rabbi Minay means that if a Jew killed a Canaanite slave, 
uh, and cost the owner of a Canaanite slave money, being obviously another Jew that owned that Canaanite slave, he wouldn't have to pay that Jew back for, for destroying his property because he's liable to the death penalty for murder. For murder. It was the same article, it was the same person. So therefore he's off the hook for murder, so he wouldn't have to pay back what the value of the slave is to the slave's Jewish owner. However, in a case where there is a goat owned by another Jew, and he says, yes, I understand that the person got the death penalty for uh, killing the other person's slave. And that's why he doesn't owe that person for killing his slave. Because it's Kim Labadi Rabamine. What does that have to do with the fact that he uh, damaged my goat and he should pay me back for the damage of my goat? What is, Kevin, your opinion as far as that's concerned? Well, goat doesn't, uh, murder doesn't, murder, the, the penalty of murder doesn't apply to a goat. The goat is a uh, property so that, you say uh, needs to be replaced. Okay, so Kevin's opinion is different to Arthur's, uh, I mean, different to Gavin's, who says that, listen, it has nothing to do, uh, it's not the same article of uh, damage, and therefore, you would still have to compensate for that. In other words, he understands, Kevin is saying, maybe the tikkun for that sin is being covered by the greater penalty because Kevin's saying something slightly different, is that murder and, and, and damage to property was caused in that same act to that same article. And therefore, since he's paying with his life for that uh, killing of the slave, he doesn't have to replace the value of that slave. Okay, but when you're dealing with a different article, that he might be losing his life, but it's not the same article which would render him having the death penalty, which means, is it based on the article or is it based on a, uh, the time period of a simultaneous act? In other words, an act where there were many casualties, and Gavin Anna holds that if it's one act that created both financial devastation as well as murder, but there were different acts that were, uh, there were different um, damages occurring within mm. the same act, ranging from murder to various cases of damage, the murder would cover for all those cases. So Kevin no, overrides and everything. Gavin, and Kevin and Gavin are of a different opinion because Kevin is saying that, listen, the goat doesn't have to do with the slave. He's already losing his life for the slave. So why does he have to pay back the slave? But a goat of another person is not necessarily well, the same thing. Now, what is Arthur maybe, saying? Maybe. Oh, okay. Arthur? Okay. Arthur. Maybe the, um, the estate can yeah, claim yeah, sorry. the estate. The goat, sorry. I thought Arthur wasn't there. Okay. Look, I disagree with both of them. I want to be the third different rabbi opinion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a bit difficult because... Uh, uh, <laughs> There's, a, there's, a, there's only two positions that you can... I know, I know, I know. I'm joking. Sorry, I was just uh, feeding my rabbit. So. Look, I think uh, it's, it's just a goat. Pay, pay the dude. Quite simply. Okay. It's not a human life. All right. So, so Arthur's holding up Kevin. So the, re mm. the reality is you are both right. And I'll tell you how. This is answering Arthur's question. Is that Logic dictates that Kevin and Arthur would be correct. That at the end of the day, yes, uh, listen, you need to pay back that damage because the act of which you're making restitution wasn't the same exact act of the damage. But you have to learn a chiddush from that, that the reason it brings us Mishnah is to say that any damage that occurred out of the same act of a death penalty, even though it has multiple owners, in other words, the slave belonged to one Jew and the goat belonged to another Jew. All of that falls away. Whatever damages he owes to various parties created by the same act that gave him the death penalty, he's covered in all of them by paying, paying the greatest penalty of losing his life for the murder. Okay, so we had to be taught that in the Mishnah. It's not obvious. It's not totally obvious. That's exactly why I bought it, because it's counterintuitive. But we learn why. Because the one is seeing it from a financial perspective and the other one seeing it from a spiritual perspective. All right. So now that we've dealt with that issue, let's just go into the Gomorrah. Guys, uh, you're not unhappy with the fact that I'm just grilling you a bit and asking you questions, even though we could have flown through this. 
Is it helping at all for Chazorah? Are you, are you grilling? Oh, is no. you grilling because the goat got burnt, Damon, also? Exactly. I'm the goat. <laughs> I'm, just like, I'm the goat grilling you or being grilled. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Listen, we're going we to gotta take revenge. Don't worry. It's, 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 we can stop giving you the day or the time. But just, Fair enough. Just, all right. Just, just be so, ready for next lap. All right. Okay. Deal. So the Gemara now examines this Mishnah. And it qualifies a dispute between the sages and Rabbi Yehuda concerning fire damage to hidden objects. Rav Kahana said, the dispute applies only where the damage allows the fire in his own property. And it went and consumed a hidden item in his fellow's property, in which case Rav Yehuda imposes his ruling that there is liability for damage to hidden objects caused by fire. And the sages say that he's not liable. But where he lights a fire in his fellow's property. In the opinion of all, he pays for everything inside it, even hidden objects. So what Rav Kahana is actually saying is, since he did not have permission to light a fire in the victim's premises, he's like one who did damage with his own hands. That's Russia's explanation. And as such, he's liable to pay even for the loss of hidden things. So he did not actually do the damage with his own person because he didn't ignite the haystack directly, but rather he kindled the fire somewhere nearby it and it spread by itself. But nevertheless, he's treated as they inflicted the damage with his own person insofar as he didn't have permission to be there. And therefore, he's liable even for the loss of hidden objects. Okay. Now, tosford has got a slightly different opinion. Uh, just let me go through this a uh, sec, guys. He explains that the sages derived the exemption from liability for fire damage to hidden objects from the word standing grain. And then that, because that was in Shemot chapter 22, verse 5. So in other words, uh, it speaks of a fire that spreads beyond the premises of the one who lit it. And, and therefore, the exemption derived from the verse applies only where you light your fire in your own premises, not where you lit in the premises of the victim. Okay, so in other words, by Rav Kahana stating uh, the word call, everything, he implies that where the fire was lit in the victim's premises, even the sages would agree with Rav Yehuda and impose liability for loss of any object that was hidden in the object. Sorry, it was hidden in the haystack. Even not one generally found there, such as a purse. So what the Gomorrah is going to go through is at points where they might agree where hidden items are covered, there might be an argument as to what is expected to be covered. Like if you left, what do you call those uh, things the, that you lift up hay with? Uh, like a, uh, uh, a, pick. a pick or whatever it is, maybe. Yeah, that you, a bale of hay. Uh, if you left that in the bale of hay, we could say that that's reasonable for coverage if you set it in the premises of um, uh, of your neighbor because you had no business being there. But you can't expect to uh, pay for something like a Picasso hidden there, even though you were negligent, because the guy could make up any rule. You know, it's not an object normally kept there. But according yeah. to Rav Kahana, uh, that's where his opinion also uh, differs from Rava, because Rava turns around uh, which we'll learn the opinion, but Rav Kahana basically says that whatever is in that haystack, if you don't light it from your own premises, that's one form of negligence where it got out of control. But when you light it in premises where you don't even have permission to be there, that goes beyond negligence. That's awesome. And therefore, anything that's in that haystack, you have to pay for. Even ob objects that you wouldn't ordinarily find because uh, you don't get any leniency. So, so we're going to uh, figure out how it works with an oath and everything else. But in the meantime, it's stated that uh, uh, in a case uh, where these words, in other words, where the sages exempt one from liability for fire damage to utensils hidden in the haystack, uh, stated where he lights the fire in his own property and when it went and consumed the haystack in his fellow's property. But if he lights the fire in his fellow's property, in the opinion of all, he pays for everything inside it. Okay. So the one issue is uh, as follows. 
there is there is a slight there is a slight problem, okay, because there is, there is a slight dispute. I think the only way I can show you where this dispute is is to actually share the mission and coral draw again, and I just want you to focus on one aspect. All right, Arth, can you see? Uh, can you see this part, the bottom part? I'm gonna zoom in. Okay, I can see it now. I've zoomed in. Yeah. Can we read it to you? From but the sages agree with Rav Yehuda. Okay. 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 But the sages agree with Rav Yehuda. In the case of the woman who sets fire to a large tower, that he pays for everything inside it. Um, because it is the way of people to put things in houses. Correct. Okay, so let me explain to you how this is relevant. Okay, so now the Gemara is going to bring a dispute with Rav Kahana that it doesn't agree with this unilateral statement to say that, listen, if the fire was hidden in the premises of your neighbor, uh, you have to cover for hidden things in the sages' agreement with Yehuda. Because I'm saying, uh, Rabbi said to Rav Yehuda, sorry, uh, okay. So Rabbi says to Rav Kahana, look, there's a problem with this. If you say that the sages agree that one who lights a fire in the victim's premises is liable for damage to all hidden things, instead of the end of the Mishnah teaching, the sages agree with Rav Yehuda in the case of one who sets fire to a large tower that he pays for everything inside it because it is the way of people to put things in houses. <clears throat> let it off. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. All right, let me try this again. Take 26. Can I just say something after you say? I just wanted to throw, add a point, but it's finished with you what, after you say. No, no, yeah. say what you say now because I'm going to have... Okay, to, uh, going back to... Hidden objects. Yeah. And the damager, the one who's created, uh, set fire to the barn or whatever. Was it a barn or was it a. Are you uh, talking uh, about a damager that sets fire? Yes. The Can the damager fire? claim that hidden stuff, maybe that. So that was so the, the, the owner, the, the, um, the, the damagee, may have hidden it there the from, so maybe that property actually belongs to someone else and uh, that the damagee uh, may be liable, uh, may have hidden it um, in, 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 in the barn and then maybe it's uh, the, the damager is not liable because it's it, it could belong to someone else. Maybe, is this point going to come up? Maybe the, hey, hang on, the you've, damaged... brought, you've actually raised a good point. I don't want to digress too much, but you raised okay. a secret point which is very good. Uh, and I'll tell you what it is, is that we are going to establish what basis can you do to validate that something uh, was uh, that was hidden is covered. So if you want to say, according to Rav Kahana, that if you set the fire in your neighbor's premises, even the sages agree with Rav Yehuda, that you have to pay the damaged party for items hidden there. Uh, but then the argument could reassert itself uh, where you say, uh, not according to Rav uh, Kahana, but if you have a fire in your own premises, it gets out of control, completely out of control, and then it burns the neighbor's premises. Rav Yehuda says you cover for hidden things. The sages say not. So let's go according to Rav Yehuda. Now, the person claims he's got a Picasso there. So do you automatically pay for it because it's an inappropriate thing to keep in that stack? Whereas if you put in a, a, a hay picker, it's not inappropriate because you just left it there. It's normal to... To, I mean, it's an associated item. Now, if it's a poor person that turns around and says the Picasso is there, you'd say, listen, pal, you, you can hardly afford a decent uh, plot of land. You mean to tell me you've hidden a Picasso there in Wabe? So in other words, um, it's different. And one of the points of evidence is if something is hidden, and we're going to learn this, and the witnesses to say, yes, I, his next door neighbor, was worried that my domestic worker would steal what I have in my house. And I asked my next door neighbor to keep a precious item in his bale of hay. And how did he know that his neighbor would set fire to his premises? And according to Rav Yehuda, uh, it's covered for hidden items. 
he didn't know his premises would end up being burnt down. And I can testify that I left my hidden item in my next door neighbor's yard so that the other next door neighbor, uh, and he takes a shavua, the next door neighbor, um, as well as the neighbor that hid the art, hidden article for that other neighbor. So that is a factor if you're hiding it for somebody else or if they're witnesses to testify as to the fact it was hidden there. But that's a separate issue entirely. Uh, but it is relevant, Kevin. It will come up as relevant. So that's a good point. What we're going to discuss here is an issue that Rava has with Rav Kahana's statement. Okay. Uh, we've got three minutes left of, of, of this one. So let's just quickly cover it. Now, what's Rav, uh, Rava's argument to Rav Kahana? If this is so that the sages agree that the one who lit a fire in the victim's premises is liable for damage for all hidden things, instead of the end of the Mishnah, which Arthur just read, uh, is teaching the sages agree with Rav Yehud in the case of one who sets fire to a large tower or a home that he pays for everything inside it because it is the way of people to put things in houses, teach this distinction in the very context of which it speaks. What does that mean? The damage to the haystack as follows. In what case were the words, namely that the sages exempt from, from liability for fire damage to utensils in a haystack where he lights the fire in his own property and it went and consumed the haystack of his fellow's property. But if he lights the fire in his fellow's property, in the opinion of all, he pays for everything inside it. So what's the primary issue here? Well, guys, this is the issue mm. that Rubber has. Just let me finish. The Mishnah's case of burning down a tower or somebody's home in which the perpetrator lit the fire in the victim's premises. But the reason that the sages impose liability, because it's normal for people to put things in houses. So the mission is implying that only where it's a fire burned down a house where people store things and it's normal, is he always liable for damage to hidden objects. But if he burnt a haystack where people don't normally store things in there, he wouldn't be liable. It doesn't matter where he set the blaze. So that contradicts Rav Kahana's teaching, which states that even where a haystack was burned, and the fire was lit in the victim's premises, the sages require the damager to pay for the loss of any item. Okay? So in other words, rather, if the Mishnah follows Rav Kahana's view, it should have remained with the original case of the haystack, instead of introducing the case of a house that burned down or tower, because it could have then taught that the damager lit the fire in the victim's premises, the sages would agree that he must pay for anything hidden in this day, haystack. We could have inferred that he must certainly pay for any hidden items in a home, which is normal. But the very fact that it brought up the fact that hidden items in a house are covered means that how do we know a haystack is uh, covered? Because if we learn from a haystack, we could have learned from a house because that's a normal behavior. If you learn from the abnormal, you can learn from the normal. But if you learn from the normal, you can't always learn from the abnormal. So he said that's a flaw and he doesn't agree with Rav Ghana. Please tell me um, what Rava's, uh, uh, why Rava doesn't agree with Rav Kahana. Tell me what this problem is. So one of them obviously says that full liability, whatever is stored in a home, regardless if it's hidden or not. And the other one says no. Um, is that no. What, the, what your question is? No, it's not the question, but uh, uh, you, you, you are right, but it's not, it's not the question. You're right for something else, but not, not in this case. Anything else, guys? But, what is Rav's complaint with Rav Kahana? I don't remember the specifics. I mean, I can't remember who said who again. I also am like Kevin here, but, uh, but I, think, I think bottom line was the problem was that uh, uh, is, uh, is, is something hidden? If it's in your neighbor and you go light in your neighbor's yard itself directly, not that doesn't stem from your yard, you light in that property, is the hidden object covered or not? And uh, and and Rabbi Kahana agrees with Rabbi, I think you would have. He says that all, all concealed items, even within the haystack, is covered. Am I not no, right? No, 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 off track, way off track. Sorry, but I'd love to okay. give it to you, but you okay, track. no. It's fine, no, but I don't know the names. That's why maybe I'm. No, it's not the names. It's your it's your concept. It's off. Okay. 
จะระบบอาราตออสอาจจะเป็นการที่เราต้องการความสัมพันธ์กันนั่นเองโอเคอาราตอาราตคุณผู้ชมผมจะบอกให้คุณรู้ว่าบาสิสของทั้งหมดของคำถามคุณรัฟคาฮันได้ตระหนักว่าและเขาตัดสินใจและบอกว่าในกรณีที่ใครก็ได้ทำให้ไฟในบ้านของเพื่อนของเขาและกระโดดเข้าไปในต้นไม้ของเขาอย่างไรก็ตามแม้แต่ท่านพระศาสดาจะตรัสกับท่านพระราชาว่าเขาเป็นผู้ป่วยของอาทิตย์ศักดิ์ศรีแต่ข้อที่ตรัสกันแล้วเพียงแค่ถ้าคนไม่สามารถหาที่ตั้งของตัวเองได้ที่สุดแล้วมันจะถูกควบคุมตัวเองได้ถ้าคนไม่สามารถหาที่ตั้งของตัวเองได้ที่สุดแล้วมันจะถูกควบคุมตัวเองได้ถ้าคนไม่สามารถหาที่ตั้งของตัวเองได้ที่สุดแล้วมันจะถูกควบคุมตัวเองได้ถ้าคนไม่สามารถหาที่ตั้งของตัวเองได้ที่สุดแล้วมันจะถูกควบคุมตัวเองได้ถ้าคนไม่สามารถหาที่ตั้งของตัวเองได้ที่สุดแล้วมันจะถูกควบคุมตัวเองได้ถ้าคนไม่สามารถหาที่ตั้งของตัวเองได้ที่สุดแล้วมันจะถูกควบคุมตัวเองได้ถ้าคนไม่สามารถหาที่ Is using this mission to say it doesn't make sense, because Arthur read that case that if somebody, I'm just going to share the mission uh, uh, again. It said, but the sages agree with Rabbi Yehuda in the case of one who sets fire to a large tower that he pays for everything inside it because it is the way of people to put things in houses. So this Mishnah is saying that the only time the sages agree with Rav Yehuda, as far as setting fire uh, to hidden items, and you covered for that, is because it's normal to put it, uh, items in our house, and if it's burning from the outside, you don't know what's burnt in there if you're looking at from the outside, because it's normal to store stuff in your house. So what Rav is saying is that it has nothing to do. Uh, with a case of where the fire is lit, because you, if you want to say that that's the case, then this mission uh, proves proves opposite in a way. Because, in other words, the logic of this is why uh, do the sages agree with Rav Yehud in this case? Because it's normal for people to keep things in houses. So even though it's hidden from. Um, The public, in terms of what's kept in the house, it's normal, and therefore, if a fire occurs, it can be believed. So, why mention a case that I've hidden in a haystack, uh, which which is abnormal to keep things? Does that does that make sense? That's that's his issue because this missioner is proving that the reason for the coverage is not where the damage occurred. But the fact that where it's normal to keep your objects, okay. So, uh, having refuted Rav Kahn's approach, Rav gives Rav gives somewhat of a different understanding of the dispute between Rabbi Yehuda and the sages. So listen carefully. Rav said they disagree in these two matters. They disagree where one lights a fire in his own property, and it went and it consumed hidden things in his fellow property. So again. The first case, he lights a fire in his own property, and it consumed hidden things in his fellow property. In which case, Rabbi Yehuda imposes his ruling that there's liability for damage to hidden things caused by fire, while the sages maintain that he is not liable. And they also disagree where one lights a fire in his fellow's property, and it consumes things that were hidden there. In which case, Rabbi Yehuda holds that he pays for everything that was in it. And even for a purse which is not usually hidden in a haystack, but the sages hold, if a fire burns utensils that are normally stored in a stack of grain, such as a threshing tool or cattle gear, in that case he pays compensation. But if it burns utensils that are not normally hidden in the stack, such as a purse, he does not uh, have to pay for compensation. You get you get that, guys. Does this Rabbi Yehuda then still? He says the haystack. The other guys just say the house. Makes sense. No, no. Uh, what 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 Rava is saying is that uh, the if you look at our Mishnah, it talks about a case where uh, the sages agree with Rav Yehuda. Okay, where if you burn it in your neighbor's prem, where if you burn it in your neighbor's premises. 
you have to pay for items in a house or a tower because it's normal to store stuff there. Okay, we talk about like a, gra a grain tower that's a storage unit called, or a house. It's normal to store stuff there. So two criteria have to be met. Number one, you're not covered for any hidden items. If you start the fire in your own premises and it spreads and hidden items are there, you're not covered. Okay? Haystack, haystack or home. Sorry to interrupt. Haystack or home. Uh, well, certainly it would seem um, it, it, it would seem haystack. I don't think it would assume home. The reason I'm saying that is I'm reading the Mishnah. Um, is um, it would seem? Uh, just give me give me one sec. Let me just see if I can look at the Mephoshim here. Just give me one second if I can look at any of the notes. That, um, mm -hmm. We, we're referring um, to only where it's written in the victim's premises. Okay, so um, as far as far as Gavin's question is concerned, Gavin, I need to come back to you because um, I would say that uh, it would make sense that there would be coverage because it's normal to keep things in the house. Yeah, you know, if you, if, you, if, you, if you would. So I actually, I actually, it's an excellent question. I would, I would check, but let's just see what's revealed to us by Rava within this context. So Rava is saying that the sages uh, and Rabbi Yehuda would agree if somebody sets fire to his neighbor's premises, that hidden items are covered, but only hidden items that are appropriate to hide in a haystack. Mm. So it would A, have to be in the neighbor's premises, the fire, and B, have to be appropriate items for it. Okay. So in other words, although the sages exempt one from liability for fire damage to hidden objects, they agree that the perpetrator must pay for the loss of the objects hidden in the house because he should have realized that people had all sorts of things there. That's according to Tosfot. Does that make sense? Which would seem to indicate to Gavin and I that... Um, even if you create a fire in your own premises, just like you're responsible for damaging your neighbor's property, a house is normal to keep things in. So in that case, it would seem normal because if we learned in 5B, you remember when we learned originally for the haystack, it wasn't talking about a house. So I think Gavin would be correct here that if, if you start a fire in your premises and you're negligent, you would pay for things that are burnt, even hidden in a house because it's normal. In terms of, uh, there'd be a, another discussion, Gavin, which would be much more difficult, is that the onus of the person that's claiming to extract money from his fellow needs proof that it's there. That's, that's, that's going to be the difficult one. Otherwise, you could claim yes. anything is there. So you talk about even for the house? Yes. You could claim yes. anything yes. is there. So that's also a principle that you'd have to apply. Uh you know, which is always a good thing to keep receipts, not in the house where it's going to get burnt down. Copy your receipts, because it's unlikely that and they not, burn. And not in the building next door, eh? Remember the Correct. Door. No, no, no. But no, seriously, it would if you have evidence in more than one place or upload it to the cloud <clears> that you bought it, etc. <throat> uh, you would, yeah. In fact, I often watch Judge Judy. I like it very much. Um. Because she often says, all right, so prove it. So look, if you contrast this guy to the Mishnah's first case, we lit the fire in his own premises. This clause refers to one who lit the fire in the victim's premises, right? So it proves as follows. It was explained by the sages that it exempts one from liability even for the loss of things that are expected to find in the entity that was burnt. Okay, so it seems that this is a... Uh, uh, Tosfot seems to have a slight dis difference here. Look here, Gavin. It says, it was explained above that the sages exempt one from liability, even for the loss of things that are expected to be found in the entity that was burnt. This appears to contradict their present ruling, which imposes liability in the case of expected things. Okay? The solution is that the first ruling applies only where the damager lit the fire in his own premises, 
Well, the second ruling applies only where he let define the victim's premises. Okay. So, so, yeah. So, it would be interesting to see in a case where a house that's normal, if they would cover that person for the hidden items. I would think, Gavin, that they would, if you could prove it. Okay. Because since he did not have permission to light the fire in the victim's premises, he's like one who damaged with his own hands, according to Rashi. As such, he is liable to pay even for the loss of things. So he didn't do the damage with his own person, but he did ignite the haystack directly, um, and it spread by itself. Nevertheless, he's treated as they inflicted the damage with his own person, insofar as he's liable even for the loss of hidden objects. Okay. Uh, so Tosfort explains that the sages derive the exemption from liability for fire damage to hidden objects from the word standing grain. The verse in this world uh, appears to be speaking of a fire that spread beyond the premises of one who lit it. Okay, so look, I think the, the bottom line is that let's keep it clear. Let's just go through Rav Kahana. Rav Kahana said that basically if you light a fire in your premises, uh, Rav Yehuda said you covered for hidden things. Uh, but the same to say we don't pay for hidden things, okay? But if you up the, uh, find the neighbor's premises, both the Rav Khan says both the sages and Rabbi Yehuda agree that you pay for damage to hidden things. Rather is saying that that doesn't make any sense because why would this mission of me have to bring up the fact that you covered within damage done to a house, okay? It's because for normal sort of damage you covered because people expect to find items in a house. So therefore, the two criteria is you have to uh, commit the fire in your neighbor's premises and it has to be normal things that could be burnt within the haystack. That's what we learned. Now, Gavin's yeah. question, just to summarize, hang on, is that um, would you be covered if you set a fire in your own premises that got out of control and since you're liable to pay for your neighbor's property and it's normal for him to keep things in his house, that you cover for those hidden items as well. To me, it would make sense that you would have to pay, but it would be an interesting thing just to chat with Rabbi Cohen. Maybe in this case, the distinction is only with the haystack that you wouldn't ordinarily have to pay and with the items in a person's house, you would. I don't know if the fact is that you... Uh, you are covered for that or not, Gavin. I'm not sure. But it's worth asking Rabbi Cohen. But you'd still again have to prove uh, the onus is on the person being damaged to prove what was damaged. Ah, okay. That's the question I wanted to ask you. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Otherwise, you could say that anything was uh, burned there. Okay. Yeah. Now, uh, let me just uh, uh, check something here. See how far we are. Sorry, guys, give me a second. We're on page 60, yeah, 61. Uh, yeah. No, but I'm just checking the commentary from Tosfot. Uh, I was checking that. Just give me one second. So the Gemara starts a related brysa. Guys, we're still in time. We've got seven minutes left. The rabbis taught in a brysa, if one set fire to a stack of grain and utensils were in it and they were burned together with the stack, Rav Yehuda says... He pays for everything that was inside it, including the utensils. But the sages say he only pays for a stack of wheat or a stack of barley. And we view the space of the utensils as though it was filled with grain. In other words, we see that whole amount as being with uh, grain that you're going to replace. Okay, not for the hidden item inside. So we also take that volumetric uh, base in the inside where the guy said there was a box of. Um, coins and we say no that that box of empty space we pay for as, as though it was gray okay so the Gemara um, said that the Bryce qualifies the sages ruling that one pay for fire damage to things hidden in the haystack in what case were these words stated where he lights the fire in his own property and it went and consumed in the stack of his fellow's property but if one sets the fire in his fellow's property the, uh, in the opinion of all, he pays for whatever was inside it. In other words, Rabbi would interpret this last issue 
is rendering one liable to pay for only things that people would hide in a haystack. As we said, Russian Tostwood said, threshing tools, cattle gear. So the problem with that explanation is that the Bryce uses the very language. Rubber contended that the Mishnah should have used if Rav Kahana's understanding of the dispute is correct. So Rashi solves the difficulty because he said he doesn't interpret the word call everything. So the mission allows Rabbi to qualify the brass as referring only to certain things. In other words, things that people would ordinarily put uh, in, a, in, in a haystack. Okay. Um, so uh, the Gomorrah uh, resolves a, a further dispute. Um, and Rav Yehuda agrees with one of the sages in the case of one who lends space to his fellow to pile up a stack of grain. Um, so what are we saying? And the fellow piled up a stack of grain and hid something in the stack. And if the owner of the field then fails to prevent his fire from consuming the stack, uh, the owner of the field only pays the value of the grain alone and not for the hidden object. Because why? Why do you think that is, Gavin? Mate, are you um, saying, all right, let's cancel it for tonight. Okay? Just repeat the question, Damon. Uh, yeah, just repeat it. I was actually listening. I thought kind of focused. Basically, James, the answer to your question is because uh, it's, 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 not, it's not a usual thing to be there. Perfect. That's the answer. So what we're saying is uh, Kevin comes to me and he says, listen, can I store some grain at your premises? I said, sure, no problem. Then there's a fire on my premises. Kevin stored his grain there. And Kevin said, actually, apart from that stack of grain, I put a valuable Picasso in there mm. and you must pay for it. And I, I was going to say, hang on a sec. I, I didn't give you permission that I would take on the headache of a Picasso. I, I'm prepared to pay you for grain because I said you can store it here. And therefore, uh, it's implicit that I'm prepared to accept uh, liability for that, but not for something exactly as Arthur said that you've got hidden there. That, you, you've put a ruse above me. You told me to look after one thing, and you've got another thing hidden in there. Arthur's absolutely correct. So th that's exactly what it's saying. So you only pay a value alone of what was claimed that the person knew was going to be there. Okay? Now, Rav Yehuda has got four cases in which it says you only pay for the value of the grain alone. So in other words, if the owner of the grain was given permission to pile up a stack of wheat, but he piled up barley instead. Okay? So in that particular case, is the in this law of the four cases coming up, the owner of the field only pays for a stack of barley. Why are we mentioning barley? Because it's cheaper than wheat. So in the first case, it seems obvious, right? Because he said, he was, uh, he said, listen, it's like Kevin said to me, can I pile up a stack of wheat? And I said, no problem. And Kevin came, uh, to pack up a stack of barley. So I think, cool. Then there's a fine. Now Kevin says, I want wheat. Because uh, um, I said to you, I was going to store wheat there. And I'd say to Kevin, I'm paying you in barley because whatever you said, you actually only stored barley at my premises. So, you know, uh, that, that your cleverness and words isn't going to cover you. I'm happy to cover you for what you're actually stuck in storage. Uh, it gives you another example. He was given permission for barley, but he piled up wheat instead. Now, I'm only responsible for paying Kevin for barley because I said to Kevin, sorry, I said to Kevin, Kevin, I'm prepared to cover your barley, which is cheaper. It's fine. Store it there. But all of a sudden, Kevin stores a very expensive item there, which I gave him no permission because I don't want the responsibility and the headache of an expensive item. So therefore, I only have to pay Kevin, for what I gave him permission to store there. If he stored something more expensive, I'm not liable for that which is more expensive, only for the equivalent of what he said he could uh, store there. Because I never would have necessarily agreed to pay that extra. The third example is he piled up wheat, which he was given permission, but he covered the wheat with barley. So that answer is that, uh, I don't know, I'm not using the example of Kevin because Kevin is not deranged. He's a sensible human being. So uh, Ish Ploini decides to hide wheat secretly in between the barley and barley's on the outside. Then the, the person turns around and said, well, there was actually wheat. I could turn around and have the same example as hidden things. 
I could say, listen, I'm seeing barley. Whatever you think was burnt in there is like a Picasso. You could call it wheat. You could call it a Picasso. I'm not paying. I gave you permission for barley. And the outside looked like barley. What do you want from me? And the fourth example is that um, uh, he piled up barley for which he was given permission, but he covered the barley with uh, wheat. So what we're saying there uh, is that um, he never accepted responsibility for wheat, and the outer layer of wheat was stored without permission. So, you know, the bottom line is that there is even a much more stringent opinion that he doesn't pay anything. Because there is that opinion that said, listen, I don't mind if you store your stuff here, but unless I give you express permission that I'm liable, uh, I'm not uh, I'm not gonna take remember I'm not gonna take liability for it. Do you, you remember we learned that previously? There is an opinion like that. Was it Raish Lokesh? Who was it, guys? Uh, so so look, in any way, the owner of the field in any of those four cases uh, has to pay for the barley's he's worth because he gave permission for that. But that's all he has to pay for. All right, guys, I think uh, uh, we can stop uh, at this point. Can I make a joke, Damon? Yeah, about barley. So Gavin, you may listen to advantage there.